Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. We're Science for the Public, and this is the Public Science Lecture Series. And tonight we are working on an astronomy topic again, uh, which is suitable for here. One of the most interesting puzzles for modern astronomers is the formation and dynamics of galaxies. There's an awful lot that is still unknown, but the technological advances in our time make the prospect of understanding galaxies much more promising. We are very fortunate to have as our guest tonight an astronomer who's working with the most advanced techniques and equipment available today. And it's a very exciting time to be doing this work. She'll explain why the sheer complexity of galaxies demands the most sophisticated means and brains to explain their formation and dynamics. Elena Dania is presently a Keck Fellow at the Harvard Center for Astrophysics, and in 2012, she'll be joining the faculty of the Astronomy Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Dania received her doctorate from the University of Milan in Italy, where her research was concerned with dark matter at the center of galaxies. During her academic training, she was awarded a number of honors, and uh, we'll try to list some of those on our website. After she received her doctorate, she was uh, a Marie Curie, fellow at the University of Zurich and a research fellow at the observatory in Munich. Now at Harvard Center for Astrophysics, she's focusing on the of, of dynamics and the evolution of galaxies. Dr. Dania has published very widely in academic literature, and she has also made an effort in her young career to communicate the mysteries of galaxies to the general public. This effort to translate scientific information to non-specialists is especially important today, as you all realize, and organizations like Science for the Public really applaud that work. We've inserted links to some of Dr. Dania's uh, articles for non-specialists on the website, on our website, her page, uh, for, and we encourage people definitely to take a look. This, and at this point, we would like to welcome Dr. Dania, who it's a great pleasure to have her join us tonight. Thank you. <laughs> so, so thank you very much for this nice introduction. So today I'm going to tell you about the properties and the challenges, the new frontiers in studying our Milky Way and the other galaxies which are in the local group of galaxies. So I would like to engage you about these topics. So here you see a sketch about our Milky Way. So our Milky Way is a disk galaxy. It has a disk. This is the galactic plane and belongs to the local group. So there's another galaxy which is called Andromeda, which is the closest galaxy, uh, the bigger closest galaxy in the local group to the Milky Way. So the other twin galaxy of the local group. And it looks like, again, like a disk, a disk of stars and gas, a little bit larger than the Milky Way, with a bulge of stars in the inner part. Also, the Milky Way has a little bulge in the inner part. So these are the biggest galaxies in the local group. Unfortunately, the local group has only two big galaxies, two these galaxies. And then, so actually, um, the uh, Andromeda is almost uh, three million light years away uh, from, from the center of the Milky Way. But there's a bunch of other galaxies, and you can see here that I just used in this sketch, which are dwarf galaxies. So they are little systems which are orbiting like satellites around the Milky Way and around Andromeda in our local group of galaxies. So the most famous one are the Magellanic Clouds, so the large Magellanic Clouds and the small Magellanic Clouds. This pair of dwarfs have been studied since a long time, really have been seen since a long time, even 
from, from the ancient people, because they are visible, they are visible essentially from the southern hemisphere of the earth, even by eyes. And so they are the most famous uh, pair uh, closer uh, to the Milky Way. But the interesting thing is that they are not the closest dwarfs to the Milky Way. There is another dwarf which has been discovered only in 1994, and it's called Sagittarius. That one is the closest dwarf to the Milky Way. Then there's a bunch of other little dwarfs, which are still uh, you know, around the Milky Way. They are more farther away, but they are still orbiting like satellites around our galaxy. So if you look at also the morphology, I just want to give you an idea how they look like, these dwarfs. So as I said, the Milky Way has an extended disk of stars and gas. It has also a lot of dark matter. I will come back to this topic. And also Andromeda is a, an extended disk of stars and gas. They are huge galaxies. But the dwarfs have different shapes. So the Magellanic clouds look to be like disky, but very regular. You see they don't look like exactly uh, an already scaled versions of Andromeda or our Milky Way. Then the majority of the other dwarfs in the local group have a different shape. They are more spheroidal. They are just a bunch of stars that look clumping together. And they are not very compact. They are very shallow. So why they are so interesting? First of all, what do we call as a dwarf galaxy? A dwarf galaxy is a galaxy which has a smaller size compared to the Milky Way or Andromeda galaxy and has many less, the number of stars is, is much, much less. So just to give you an idea, in, in the disk of the Milky Way, there are maybe something like 100 billion of stars. But if you look at these dwarfs, they have just a few millions of stars. And these are the brightest. There are even dwarfs which are even fainter and fainter than people are discovering now, and they have just thousands of stars. So it's a really, really uh, different scale we are talking about. So they are less luminous than the Milky Way, less massive, and much smaller in size. Also, which are the properties of these dwarf galaxies? Why they are so interesting? Why am I want to engage you about this topic? Well, first of all, these galaxies seem to be very old. So the stars are very old. They have no gas, the majority of them. I'm not talking about the Magellanic clouds, but I'm talking about the rest of the dwarf spheroidas which are around the Milky Way, the Andromeda. They have a few stars, very old, and no gas. So they are essentially systems. So they are very old. They formed in the early phases of the universe. But they still manage to arrive uh, around the Milky Way today. So the Milky Way, it's probably um, less, uh, it's uh, much younger, so it's less old than these systems. And so they are a little bit the health of the universe, and that's why they are so interesting. Also, as I said, some has uh, more spheroidal shapes, some are more disky. The ones who are more disky have a bit more gas, they have more star, more stars, also more star formation, actually. And also the other interesting thing is that these systems uh, are extremely interesting because they have a, lot of, a, a huge amount of dark matter as compared to the amount uh, of stars that they contain. So they have a few stars, but a lot of dark matter, and I will get back to this topic again. Also, very, recent, very recently uh, has been discovered another class of dwarfs, which have been called ultra-faint dwarfs. So these dwarfs, you can see, actually, maybe you cannot see here, so they are very hard to be discovered, and they have been only discovered in the last uh, few years because of the abilities, uh, the capabilities of the new telescopes uh, to, go, um, to go deeper and deeper around the sky. And so it was possible to reveal and to, um, you know, to see uh, stars which are overabundant or a little bit like over densities, more concentrated that uh, are inside these dwarfs. Otherwise, you know, years ago, it was impossible to distinguish the dwarfs, the stars that belong to these dwarfs, from the background. And indeed, it's very hard to, to find them. So why do cosmologists care about dwarf galaxies? So I'm a cosmologist, so I'm interested in, in understanding the nature, the evolution of the universe, how the mother and how the galaxies are forming in, uh, in our universe. So we do care because, as I said, these systems form very early in the phases of the universe. They're, they're very old. So we, if we can understand how they managed to survive up to now, we have extraordinary information about uh, the early universe. So we, we can know something about the formation of the first systems. And also because cosmologists are, um, we, we believe that uh, um, the most favored um, scenario for 
the formation, for the evolution of the universe is a, a, a scenario in which uh, uh, the distribution of the mass, uh, the mass, the total mass of the universe is essentially dominated from uh, not from the visible mass, not from the ordinary mass, not from gas, not from stars, not from the atoms we have been formed from, but it's essentially dominated from dark matter. So we don't know exactly the nature of the dark matter, but this is what most of the universe is, do is done uh, from. And we know that we call it dark matter because it's not, it does not emit light, so we cannot really see any emission from this matter in the universe. But we know that it, we interact in, in the sense that we know the presence of the dark matter because of the gravity. And so in the last 15 years or 20 years, it was possible, thanks to the abilities and the new computational power, um, it, it was possible to, to follow um, the evolution of the dark matter so the distribution of the dark matter and the evolution of the universe in the universe using numerical simulations. So this was very helpful to cosmologists. And indeed, this is an example of a simulation I will show you soon, where you could see that we assume, we believe in our most favorite, favorite scenario for, for the formation of the, of the universe, of the matter in the universe, that the dark matter was initially a smooth field. So the distribution of the matter was very smooth. But because there are always areas in the universe where you could start seeing, even in the early phases of the universe, that there are areas where there is a little bit more matter than other parts of the universe. Because there are little concentrations of matter higher compared to other areas, the gravity uh, acts, becomes stronger, and so the gravity pulls the matter uh, farther and farther, so it pulls uh, essentially the matter um, in a way that they form little clumps. And so, because these clumps are heavier than the surrounding material, they attract more dark matter, and so they become larger and larger. And so, these uh, little uh, clumps of dark matter uh, merge. Initially, they are very small but then the gravity becomes stronger because they are heavier, they pull together material, and so they become larger and larger. And we believe that this hierarchical formation of the mother, the distribution of the mother in the universe, is the way uh, that uh, even the Milky Way has been formed. So you can see here that there are a lot of lumps in the early phases, they come together, they merge, and this is essentially a simulation that reproduces uh, an area of the universe, a volume of the universe, which is uh, roughly the volume similar where the local group, where our Milky Way and Andromeda have been formed. So you can see that we are predicting a lot of little lumps. These are lumps of dark matter. And these lumps, essentially, you know, they merge and they assemble larger, larger halos are exactly these clumps that we call dark halos. They will host the visible galaxies. So the dark halos are like halos of dark matter around each galaxy, and even these little halos here, these sub-halos, will contain dwarf galaxies. So this is the idea behind the formation of galaxies um, in, in the current scenario for, for, for the structure formation. So why do cosmologists care about dwarfs? Because when we try to simulate, when we see these simulations, we have seen a lot of clumps which come into the Milky Way halo. And, but these clumps, they should contain a lot of dwarfs. But when we see around how many dwarfs, uh, when people look at, actually 15 years ago, we look at how many dwarfs uh, are visible around the Milky Way, they found that there was a discrepancy uh, in, comparison, in comparison with the theory, with the predictions of, of the theory. So this was called the missing satellite problem. Now also, so we care because we care about how the Milky Way formed. Also, they are, as I said, these systems are extremely dark matter dominated. So they, if you compare the amount of stars uh, compared to the total mass in these little systems, they have much more dark matter content compared to the amount of stars than the Milky Way. So why these systems are so small, so old, and so dark matter dominated? This is also a very interesting question for cosmologists. Also, what has been found uh, recently, in the last few years, and, and this is why this topic is so interesting now, is that thanks again to the capabilities of new telescopes to see around the Milky Way and going deeper and deeper and resolving more and more stars, uh, researchers have found that there are a lot of streams of stars and gas around the Milky Way and around Andromeda. 
And these streams of gas and stars are usually um, associated, are very specially associated to uh, dwarf galaxies. And so we believe that dwarf galaxies might be responsible for the formation of the streams of stars and gas. Also because there are so many clumps, visible or not, or maybe completely dark, which are um, orbiting around the Milky Way and Andromeda, and because the disk of the Milky Way and the disk of Andromeda, they show features like uh, spiral arms, we believe it's possible that there is a connection, there is a link between the interactions of the dwarf galaxies and the disk of the spiral, of the larger galaxies. And so maybe these dwarfs might be responsible in triggering some perturbation and maybe forming some of the features like the spiral arms that we see in, in spiral galaxies. So the spiral arm formation is a very old problem and usually was, um, was, a, was essentially studied from mathematicians uh, in, uh, in previous centuries and now it's also a matter for astronomers. So what is the missing satellite problem? As I showed you before, this is an example of a cosmological simulation like the ones I showed you before. So this is the halo that contains the Milky Way, this maybe is the halo that contains Andromeda, and you see these lumps around which are the subhalos that should contain the dwarfs. So if you calculate the cumulative number, if you sum up all the numbers of these lumps within a certain radius, you see that you are predicting something like 500 dwarfs, we should see 500 dwarfs um, in, around the Milky Way and Andromeda in our local group. Now, until I would say more than 50, almost 10 years ago, maximum 15 years ago, the number of visible dwarfs around the Milky Way was only 11. And another 11 was, were around, around the Andromeda. So there was a really little, little amount. So there was a huge discrepancy when people compared for the first time numerical simulations with the amount of dwarfs observed around the Milky Way. But I have to say that this question, this missing satellite problem, triggered, you know, it just engaged a lot of researchers to look for dwarfs around the Milky Way. And with the new telescopes, people found more and more dwarfs, fainter and fainter, ultra faint dwarfs with just a few thousand of stars. And now the number of observed dwarfs around the Milky Way and Andromeda increased, increased a lot. So we are reducing uh, a lot the discrepancy between the predictions and and the, and the observations. Of course, there's a huge limit in these simulations. These simulations do not contain any, um, they, they cannot describe the visible matter, so they cannot describe the gas and the stars because it's a very, it's a very hard job, but I will show you that we are, we are getting to that point. And so they are limited in the sense that they can only describe by gravity the evolution and the distribution of the dark matter. So those spheroidals are also interesting, as I said, because they are most dramatic dominated systems. So this is again an example. So this is a, one of the dwarf spheroidal around the Milky Way. So you can see that you know, it's a bunch of stars, not very, very, very shallow. And this is another dwarf, so it's very hard to find it because it's difficult to distinguish the stars that belongs to the dwarf from the background. This is why essentially this problem the search for dwarfs around the Milky Way is so difficult. So if we want to, as cosmologists, if we want to understand how this system formed, uh, we need to come up with ideas, with processes uh, that can remove stars and gas from the systems like dwarfs because they need to remain dark matter dominated because that's what the observations essentially showed us. Indeed, when uh, researchers um, measure dwarf spheroidas, they know that they have a lot of dark matter because they can measure uh, the motions of the stars inside these dwarf spheroidas. And the motion is, uh, is pointing out that there is much more mass. The motion of the stars is like, the, uh, is like if the stars act, uh, if there's much more mass than what we really uh, observe. And so that's why we believe that there is a lot of dark matter in these systems. So the classic theory to explain why these systems are so their mother dominated is to, to go back uh, to, to point out or simply to appeal uh, to um, an epoch uh, in the phases of the universe, in the evolution of the universe, which is called the Reionization Epoch. It's a period where the gas 
around uh, the universe was warmed up from um, the light, uh, from source light, essentially. And so it was warm up, and if you have the gas in little subhalos that should contain, so they should contain the dwarfs, and the gas should form the stars when it collapses inside these little halos. So this theory says that maybe because it's warm up, the gas will evaporate from the dwarf and so will not form stars. And that would explain why these systems don't have many stars and they don't have gas. Of course, to, to prove this theory, it's very hard. It's very difficult because um, simulations where the ionization can be uh, included in, in, a, in a good way uh, at, the, at the time, at this time, are not available yet. So we can only uh, make hypotheses, but we cannot really test this theory. So because of this, we came out with an, another uh, idea. So a couple of years ago at Harvard, we published uh, this paper where we proposed that maybe dwarf spheroidal galaxies, they become solar matter dominated because of process that can remove efficiently stars and gas, but not the dark matter from the dwarfs. And they will tell you in which way. So our idea was that initially we know that in the early phases of the universe, the dwarf galaxy should be the nominated population of galaxies because the little things form first in our scenario for the structure formation. So because of the gravity, if you have two dwarfs, and initially we know that the dwarfs uh, are probably in the early phases of the universe were more disky, or the galaxies have been more disky initially, they are not spheroids, but they are more, they have a, a disk component. By gravity, the dwarf can, can um, attract one another, and so um, if they have a similar mass, they can merge, but if they don't have a similar mass, they just interact one another, so they orbit one around the other. So this is the simulations that we have done where we simulate two, dwarf, two dwarfs which are approaching one each other, they are just interacting. And so you can see after a little short time, you start forming a long stream of stars. And this is one of the dwarfs, this is the little dwarf, which is the victim, it's losing a lot of stars. And after a few other time, uh, you see that there are some features which are formed, like shells of stars around the larger dwarf. So what happens here? Why do we lose uh, stars and we end up with something which is dark matter dominated? So we believe that what happens in these simulations is that there's a sort of gravitational resonance. Now resonance is sometimes a, a difficult um, task to, uh, to be understood. Just to give you an idea of what the resonance is, um, usually we have, uh, so if you, if you heard about this, but there was this bridge, it's called the Tacoma Narrow Bridge. And they built it up, I think it was in 1940. You could see that there are vibrations in the bridge. Essentially, it was at the end of the movie, the bridge collapses. So these vibrations are, are driven from the wind. So what happens is that the wind perturbs the bridge because it drives it to its natural frequencies. So when the frequencies matches, you have a resonance, you have a, you know, a sort of, um, sort of uh, when they match essentially, that's the, how the resonance works. So in our case, we have a, a little dwarf, a little dwarf which is the victim here, that feels the perturbation from a larger perturber. So the other dwarf is like the wind. It's uh, driving uh, the stars which are rotating in the disk to their natural frequencies, to the natural frequencies of the victim. And because of this match in, frequenc in frequencies, you start losing material. And I will show you how. So we are talking about um, a process which is called uh, um, gravitational, we call it gravitational stripping, resonance stripping, or gravitational resonance. So the interesting outcome, the surprising outcome of this process is that if you try to quantify how much dark matter a system has, like a dwarf, when it's going through a resonance, a gravitational resonance. So initially, uh, we have a, um, a fixed amount of stars compared to dark matter, but when the dwarf interacts with the other dwarf and it's in resonance with the other dwarf, with the orbital, when it's a spin frequency, it's re in resonance with the orbital frequency, you start losing material, you start losing stars, 
And so the amount of, the, of dark matter compared to the amount of stars, it's increasing. And that's the way, a way we, we try to explain why these systems are, are so dark matter dominated. So in the simulations I showed you before, um, these are the same simulations. In this case, we really uh, were, we paid attention to have the resonance happening. And this is the little dwarf, the victim, which is losing material at the minimum distance uh, from the larger system, which is the perturber. You see, you form this stream of stars. So the outcome of this process is the formation of a tail of tails of stars. We made the same simulation, but in this case, we paid attention not to have a matching frequencies, so not to have a resonance. So we did not align dwarfs in a way that they had a resonance. And indeed, you don't see the very extended tails that you see in this case. So what we, I want to show you essentially is that this process might be interesting because in, in certain conditions when the resonance happens, it's able, uh, it's very efficient in removing stars and gas. So how do we form these tails of stars? So how it works? So if you are in the case where the resonance happens, so you should look at now this sequence uh, uh, counterclockwise. So here I sketched the little dwarf, this is the victim, so these are the stars rotating in the disk, and they are feeling the perturbation from a larger dwarf. So in this case, because we set up in a way that the dwarf, the disk is rotating and it's aligned, uh, you know, it's rotating uh, in the same direction as the other dwarf is coming along the orbit, and because we want to have a resonance in this case. So if you focus on a star, the star will feel the perturbation, will feel the gravity from the perturber, and you see that it's rotating, so after a short time, you know, it, it just, it's just rotating here in the disk, but the perturber also is going on the same direction. So they are going both on the same direction, so the stars are always pulled in the same direction because the perturbers is always aligned with the, with the dwarf. And so because of this resonance, they were pulled always in the same direction, and after some time, the stars will start losing, you start going far away from the dwarf, and so you start forming like a long tail of stars. But in the case where the resonance doesn't happen, and this is a case where the victim, the stars are rotating in this direction, and you know, the perturber maybe is rotating on the opposite direction, so in this case, they are not aligned, so the frequencies do not match. And so if you look at this time clockwise, the sequence, so the stars rotate in this way, so after a while is here, but the perturber is on the opposite side. And so the stars are pulled inwards, outwards, inwards, outwards. That means that at the end of the sequence, they, did not, uh, they are not so far away from the dwarf, they're just stuck very close to the dwarf, and so you don't form any, any tails. So maybe you can believe that this process uh, might not be common, because it's, it's about resonances, how often they match uh, these frequencies. Indeed, it is very common. It was already discovered from Tumor, actually. It was pointed out from Tumor a long time ago from a scientist uh, that worked for a long time at MIT. And uh, um, let me show you, um, this is a simulation of two galaxies, two disk galaxies interacting by gravity. And these are images that you can see on the sky. So this is an image of interacting galaxies in the sky, so these are real observations. These are called the antenna galaxies. They are two galaxies which are merging, in the process of merging here. And you see here, here, even here and here, long tails of stars. And if you see in a simulation of interacting galaxies that we form also stars, long tails of stars, very similar to what you, you can observe in the sky. So this process is very common. You see here, this is very similar to the antenna galaxy. You see here when they are almost merging and you see these long tails of stars which are due to this gravitational resonance, this resonance stripping. Also, it's interesting, if you look at the sky, there are other galaxies like uh, the famous Tadpole galaxy. So this galaxy has a long tail of stars, and it's interesting because it has, a, it, it's in, in reality, it's an interaction of two galaxies. You see the bigger galaxy here, the little galaxy is here, 
so it's almost inside the other galaxy and the tail belongs to the little victim, so it does not belong to the larger galaxy. And this is a simulation we have performed uh, where the resonance is happening and you can see that we can also get similar features. Also, this is a, a simulation we have done and these are observations. So this is again a simulation of two interacting dwarfs and you see shells around the larger dwarf. This is the little victim which has been stripped of stars and you see here in images of this galaxy, the NGC 2782, it's also an interaction and it, look like that there are, it looks like there are a lot of shells around the stars. So these are not the only um, uh, signs of uh, um, resonances or stripping uh, or tidal interactions around the Milky Way. There's a majestic Magellanic stream of gas. It's called the Magellanic stream because it's associated to the Magellanic clouds. It's a huge stream of gas. You can see here, so this is the plane of our Milky Way, the galactic plane. So this huge stream is a huge stream of gas. So it's, it's observed in radio. And you can see that it goes along the sky. And these are the two molecular clouds. So the, the giant and the, small, and the, the giant, the large, uh, molecular, uh, the large, sorry, Magellanic clouds and, and, and the small Magellanic clouds. So this is the pair of dwarfs. And this gas is associated to them. So probably it's, it's lost from the Magellanic clouds um, into the Milky Way. So the origin of this majestic uh, Magellanic stream uh, is, uh, is, uh, was unknown for, for a long time, was very puzzled. And so there are two uh, ideas behind how this stream uh, can be formed into the Milky Way. So one idea was that this gas is stripped uh, from the clouds when they fell into the Milky Way. And there was also, for a long time, it was also, um, uh, it was people supposed that the, the Magellanic clouds were, uh, were orbiting along the Milky Way uh, since a long time, so for many, many orbits. But very recently it has been discovered that the Magellanic clouds, thanks to new measurements of their velocities, it has been discovered that they are just falling into the Milky Way for the first time. So these pairs of dwarfs are just coming into the Milky Way very recently. And so this made the puzzle a little bit more complicated because the other idea was that these clouds uh, might interact by tidal interactions, so by sort of resonances, and they might produce, uh, might lose um, some of the gas from their disk um, and because of the interaction of the two dwarfs, and then this uh, huge stream of gas is just amplified uh, by the gravity, uh, by the presence of the Milky Way once they fell in. And indeed, in the last few years, uh, in the, a few years ago appeared this radio image of the, of the Magellanic Stream, so the observers found that you know, there's, there are essentially two tails, there's a, um, a trailing arm and there's a leading arm. And so usually, and these are the two, the, the two um, um, clouds, so, and you can even see a bridge, a bridge of gas between one cloud and the other cloud. So the idea is that it's probably, these observations are essentially supporting the idea that the Magellanic Stream has really an origin, a tidal origin, so it's really due to the gravity between the two clouds and also because we see some gas that's attracted from one cloud to the other cloud. So it probably came together as a pair and when they fell in, also they were losing already uh, the gas, but when they fell in, this gas is amplified. And indeed, I think Gurtina Besla um, made a very good job in showing uh, um, last year that um, this is a model where the pairs of dwarfs, so the two uh, clouds, are losing uh, uh, by tidal interaction their gas, and once it falls into the Milky Way, it's essentially amplified by the presence of the potential of the Milky Way. So again, you can see the same model. So now the clouds are interacting by tidal interaction, so by sort of gravitational resonance. And as an outcome of this resonance, there is this stripping of the gas. And then the gas goes across, across the sky uh, exactly very similar, in a very similar way as uh, as essentially, this is how they, how they look like now, where they are positioning now uh, the two clouds. But the majestic uh, Magellanic uh, stream is not the only stream we have in the local group. 
I think thanks uh, to the Panda surveys, so this was a new service that came out that's essentially finishing uh, uh, the observations uh, just now, has found that this is a Canadian Hawaii telescope survey. So they found an amazing stellar halo around Andromeda. So this is Andromeda, the twin companion of the Milky Way. There's a huge stellar halo around Andromeda. And for the first time, this survey could really resolve the details of, um, you know, really of these stellar halos. So it found a lot of little dwarf and associated to these dwarfs, which are these spots here, there are a lot of little streams, um, which are the result of, again, tidal interactions of the dwarf with the larger system like Andromeda. Also here, there is a companion, a dwarf galaxy companion of Andromeda, it's called the M33. And also, I will show you that the interactions between the, this, these two galaxies, it's probably responsible for the formation of the huge stellar halo. So this halo is extended almost uh, something like 900,000 light years. So here around M33, it's uh, already, this circle here, it's around 300,000 light years. And there are also distortions uh, uh, due to this tidal interaction. They are probably exactly due to the fact that the two galaxies are are essentially um, interacting uh, um, by gravity. So in this simulation, um, John Dubinsky has shown what probably happened um, in Andromeda uh, in interaction with M33, and that's probably how the result of this halo uh, came out. So initially, M33 was probably um, a certain distance from Andromeda. So now it's, it's interacting, so you see these tails of stars, they are due to these tidal interactions, so they are again a sort of gravitational resonance happening. And then this is the maximal distance where M33 is from Andromeda, and now it's coming. Ah. So it's going a straight on back and forth, not over there, it's not No, there's, there's also an orbit, and now it's... Uh, yeah, there is. So the interesting thing is that it's losing a lot of material, M33, and you see that the stars are forming streams and then they are pulled back towards Andromeda because they are attracted by gravity. So this kind of simulations and they can justify, also they can um, support our idea of the hierarchical formation of galaxies because they show that essentially the dwarf can lose material, can lose stars, and these stars goes on the larger halo of the largest galaxy. And so all the little stripping that we see here, all the stars that we see here are probably just lost by stripping when these dwarfs are orbiting around the larger galaxy. And so this hierarchical structure formation scenario is probably correct. Also, if you see M33 has also disk, this is a disk uh, of gas and there's a little bridge here of gas. So the gas is distorted. Also, these distortions are due uh, to the interactions with Andromeda. So even if you know, the dwarf don't really pass uh, uh, through the, the galaxy, but they are just interacting, by tidal interactions, they can still be distorted and, and losing material. Also, another interesting topic for cosmologists and why do we care about dwarfs is that, as I said, we are predicting a huge number of clumps which should orbit around the Milky Way. We don't see all of them, but they might be also interesting because some of these clumps might pass through the disk, they just beat the disk, and they can excite the disk in a way that the disk reacts, forming maybe the spiral arms that we see around the Milky Way. Uh, well, we don't really see around the Milky Way, but we see around other spiral galaxies, and we believe that also Milky Way has some spiral. This is a simulation we have performed uh, uh, at Harvard about the formation of spiral arms. 
So here what we did is to consider a galaxy. So we, uh, we set up a galaxy with a, a huge number of, of stars. It's not really matching the Milky Way, but it's still uh, 100 million of stars. And then we bombard the disk with these dark clumps as they are predicted from, from cosmology, as they are predicted from our theory of structure formation. And we see um, what happens if we can really excite the disk and form in this... Excuse me? With clumps, with uh, dark clumps, with, with dark clumps, we are bombarding the disk with dark clumps and we see if, this, uh, if these clumps or these dwarf galaxies passing through the disk can create, can perturb the disk in a way that the disk, the disk reacts and form maybe the spiral arms that we see uh, in, uh, in spiral galaxies. So the, the answer is essentially we, we do not believe much about this scenario, so they are probably not responsible for the formation of the arms because if you see the shape uh, of these arms here, they look like circles. So they are much more round than the one that we observe in the spiral galaxy in the nearby. So in this case, the arms, uh, what we observe, are like segments, and so they are more open. And in the case where, where we bombard the disk, with, we consider the clumps uh, as the source of this perturbation, we see uh, shapes which are not exactly uh, matching uh, what, what we observe. So indeed, what we are doing now is since, uh, if you look at the sky, the shape of the arms is very different. So some, so our galaxy, the Milky Way, maybe looks like this galaxy here. So this galaxy, for example, is not interacting with any visible dwarf. It doesn't have any visible dwarf very close. But there are other galaxies like M51 that has a lower number of arms, only two, maybe. And in this galaxy, there is a satellite galaxy which is interacting with this galaxy here. So maybe in this case, uh, you know, it, it's possible that the tidal interaction are the source of perturbation that excite the formation of these uh, spiral arms. But maybe for this kind of galaxy, it's more hard to, it's more hard to say. So what we are doing to try to simulate these kind of galaxies where there's no an obvious interaction with the visible dwarf is to consider clumps of gas which are co-rotating within the disk. And we, we, are, we are finding that this kind of idea is, a, is supporting, actually is reproducing uh, some of the observations. So this is a, a one of the outcome of our simulation. So this is the, the disk of, the, of a galaxy simulated. Um, inclined, here it's face on. So you see that we start forming arms very quickly. And they look like that they are also uh, long lived. So you see that they are much more open and more like segments, more in agreement with the observations for many of the spirals. Also, I will end uh, my talk uh, giving you an idea about the final frontier for galaxy formation. So I told you before that we tried in the last 15 years, 20 years, uh, people uh, got, got a sense of what's going on in the distribution of the dark matter in the universe by gravity. So using numerical simulations, we are able to, to understand how the halos that host the visible galaxies um, are built up. So even the halos of the Milky Way, the halos of Andromeda, our, our, our local group or groups of galaxies. But we were unable, we were not able um, to uh, introduce uh, in a correct way um, the hydrodynamics, so the descriptions of the physics uh, like uh, how gas and stars evolve in the universe in a self-consistent way, in a cosmological context. But finally, I think, uh, you know, this is a new, a new time, it's a good time for doing uh, theoretical astrophysics because it's also cosmology, because uh, there, is a, there are now new codes which have been developed uh, recently that are able to describe more correctly the physics of the gas and the stars inside the galaxies and to follow maybe in a proper way, in a self-consistent way, the formation of galaxies like our Milky Way. So, um, this is an example of uh, one of these uh, new simulations that are coming up. So it's a cosmological simulation, so it's not dark matter only. There's, only there's also gas and stars inside. And so you can see this is a portion, a volume of the universe simulated. 
and we can start seeing with a very unprecedented detail uh, what com what's coming out and how the galaxies are formed. So here we are zooming uh, um, on galaxies, so this galaxy might look like the Milky Way. So you can see this is an extended disk of gas. Around there's all dark matter and, and gas along filaments. So you can see that looks like a disk. There are even spiral arms now <laughs> appearing here. So the other clumps that you see around are, are very far away, but these are other galaxies that are forming um, in this volume of the universe. And also you could see here tails. So here you see interacting galaxies. So these are two disk galaxies that are interacting. And these are tails, tails of gas and stars that will come out as, a, as an outcome of these tidal interactions. So we are finally achieving the point in the time where we can study properly uh, galaxy formation and eventually we can compare uh, to the observations. So also from the same kind of simulations, so this is a sample of, of dwarf, of, sorry, of uh, uh, galaxies like uh, the Milky Way. Some look like the Milky Way, some look like mospheroidals. Some have features here like tails or um, rings. So there's, so there's a sample of galaxies that come out in a self consistent way in a cosmological context that might look like uh, what we observe uh, in the sky. So I think it's a good time to do theoretical astrophysics because we have uh, due capabilities in telescopes to uh, find more and more dwarfs, to look at more, more in details how the Milky Way uh, look like, how the stars are monitored around the Milky Way, and also uh, we have all the theoretical tools to study in details how they form in our uh, universe. Thanks for your attention. Yes, so you first asked about the code, which code we use. So we, we don't, uh, usually we don't develop codes uh, um, because these are very um, difficult simulations. So there are codes that have been developed along the years and in particular at the Max Planck, uh, this code is a new code that has been, will, will be not be available to community but is available to our group and so these new simulations have been have been done uh, thanks uh, to the capability of this code to describe better the physics. So um, we use a, a very com complex code to describe other dynamics uh, and the dark matter distribution. And the second question was uh, how, so if we pick up a particular time uh, when, when we look at, so we usually, uh, in these cosmological simulations, uh, we usually follow the dark matter distribution and eventually now the gas and the stars for 13 billion years. And so up to the time that we observe today and we want to compare what come out, comes out from the simulations what we observe in the sky today. But of course, um, you know, the fact that we can use simulations uh, help us because we can stop or we can, we can have a snapshot of the, of the simulations along the time and there are observations of high redshift galaxies, so mm -hmm. galaxies which are very far away, that means they are very, uh, very uh, back in time. And so we can still compare, uh, you know, along the time where we run the simulation, what's going on in the evolution of the galaxies. So this is one of the big goals uh, that we try to achieve in, uh, in doing uh, numerical simulations like this. They are a wonderful lab uh, to compare uh, the data along the time um, uh, with, uh, with, with what we predict. When you, say dark, when you say dark matter has a halo, do you mean a dark halo or a halo of light? Uh, but we say dark halo, so she's asking about what I mean with dark halo. So this is a halo that's surrounding each, uh, each galaxy. So it contains the, vi the visible galaxy and it's done of dark matter. Yes. yes uh, you're looking at some of those gas spirals. It looks striking like a hurricane. Is there any similarities to be drawn between uh, the behavior of clouds on Earth and you know, ga gases in the galaxy? And can one, uh, observing one, form uh, facts about the other? Well, uh, 
the features maybe we were talking about it's that it are these arms that are uh, very very strong they are like arms that are formed inside the galaxies so the formation of the arms is still very debated i think it's um, i said before during my talk this was a problem that was, was approached already from mathematicians in the previous centuries now astronomers are trying to explain it so it's not really exactly clear what, what drives uh, the formation of the arms uh, but it's, um, so the idea is that probably the most common idea is coming out now is that it's, um, it's a sort of uh, reaction of the disk to some perturbation. So it's uh, something like a perturbation that's driving a, a reaction of the disk, a dynamical reaction. And so because of this reaction to the perturbation, the disk starts forming wakelets, uh, which becomes like the arms that we see around. So it's not vortexes. So it's not, it's not in that case, it's not a similar thing like vortexes but it's really driven from the gravity inside the disk. Maybe? Yes, um, we talk about uh, looking back in time millions and millions of light years away and seeing the early, earlier formations of the universe. Uh, and other matter that we're looking back at. Yes, maybe it's a sketch here. Uh, so initially there was a big bang. Then very quickly, you know, the material, so it, the universe evolves in a very, uh, in, a few, in a few minutes, essentially. So all these simulations are essentially in agreement with the Big Bang theory because they are based also on the cosmic um, uh, microwave background, so the background radiation that has been only third, 380 years, th uh, 380,000 years after, um, after the Big Bang. And so, the evolution of the universe comes in a way that, you know, the structure formations happens much later. But even before, you start having the seeds of the structure formation. Because of the gravity, you start forming first, you know, these little halos by gravity. They collapse, they form clumps, and then they will host the future visible mother. So what we were able uh, to do on a few, until a few years ago was only to follow in a correct way how the gravity works. But now the gas and the stars also can be uh, you know, added to this picture. It's just that the hydrodynamics uh, um, is, is very complicated. And so um, it's difficult to, to know, you know if we can end up with a, with, a, with a picture that looks like exactly what we observe. But these codes and, and now this, uh, this new frontier in cosmology, uh, we're probably able to tell us you know, if there are discrepancies or not between the theory and the observations. For example, I talked about missing satellite questions. So where are these dwarfs that we don't see? But it's also true that we never introduced um, in a correct way before this time now um, the baryons, so the visible matter, like a gas and stars. And so maybe new simulations that are coming out now at this time can reduce still uh, the discrepancy between the observations and, and, and the theory because we properly um, uh, follow uh, also the visible matter. Maybe on the back? Uh, I think that gentleman was asking actually how the matter got dispersed to such a great distance between the galaxies. Because the stars are all moving in different spheres. So how they get the spin, the galaxies? Are you asking this? Yes. yes. So they, they get spin because um, you have a, because initially you form these, uh, um, you know, you form filaments in the early phases of the universe. So you form, um, so initially when you look at these simulations, you start forming large scale structures. So, and these are filaments uh, um, by gravity, by torques, uh, so they exert some, some, some gravity, some, some interactions on, 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 the, on the clumps which are uh, the host, they will be the host of the visible galaxies. So these clumps start feeling this gravity and they start spinning. So initially, okay, in these simulations, uh, um, so the gas collapses, uh, you know, it collapses, it, you keep the angular momentum conserved, so the gas collapses uh, in, in the disk, and so um, you, you start having, so you conserve the angular momentum essentially. And, and so um, when you go to the very um, small scales, uh, that's still unclear how the cooling happens, so we don't know if it's, you know, how the spin, how the spin really will work on the very little systems. But in these systems, uh, you just uh, have you know, conservation of the angular momentum, and so the gas collapses and, and start going uh, on a disk. And the disk, uh, and essentially the spin, is gained from the torques. Uh, 
uh, that they feel from the larger scale structure. So that's the way they get up the spin. So the details exactly uh, are, not, are not known yet because these simulations are just the first attempt. So we have to look at exactly if things work as uh, you know, was supposed that they should work. Um, so until, so in, in the previous years, uh, essentially what, what was failing with these kind of simulations was that, um, so the previous codes were not able to form uh, consistent disks. So the, mm, the visible matter, so the gas, was really collapsing in the inner parts of the disk. It was not really conserving the angular momentum. And so for that reason, you were not ending up with, uh, with nice disks, but only with like, uh, you know, like a, a bunch of, uh, um, uh, of gas in the inner parts of the, of the galaxy. And so it was not possible to see uh, how um, disks also can interact and can merge and forming uh, uh, different kind of galaxies that we observe in the universe. So this is probably the first time we can do something um, on that way. Um, maybe that. Um, so, dark, is dark matter energy? Is dark matter? No, we assume, okay, <laughs> in the kind of simulations we have done, we are assuming that um, because we know that the dark, we don't know what is the dark matter, but we know that dark matter is almost 90% of the, of the mass of the universe. And so, uh, we are assuming that um, there is a, a halo around each dwarf. And the halo is distributed as the cosmological simulations or the theory tells us should be distributed. So it's not very concentrated in the inner part. So it's a, essentially it's not very, it's a, it's a halo in the outer part of the, of, the, of the galaxy. So in the inner parts of a galaxy, even of a dwarf, uh, the, the dominant part is always a little bit of baryonic ordinary matter. So we simulate um, assuming that the dark matter is a, uh, um, is what we uh, suppose it is from, from theory. So we cannot really prove that it's uh, with this kind of simulations, this idea, which kind of dark matter is, or uh, you know, if it's a correct uh, uh, scenario. We just try to see if we end up with a scenario with the process that can explain why the dark matter is so uh, dominating in these little systems. The dark matter is not removed uh, because it has different orbits. So uh, because in the simulations we see, if we believe that dark matter is a cold dark matter as uh, this theory is uh, um, supporting, is, uh, is predicting. So it's, uh, the orbits of the dark matter by gravity um, are very different uh, from the stars uh, in a disk. So it's not rotating in a disk. It's just, uh, it has just random orbits, all the particles of dark matter. And so if this is true, that means that they cannot, um, maybe some particles of dark matter can resonate, can, can feel, of course, this uh, uh, resonance stripping, but globally, uh, since there's no, there's no rotation of the dark matter, there's no consistent rotation of the dark matter globally because the orbits are just random. And so they do not, they, you, you cannot globally remove uh, the, uh, the, the dark matter like you would remove the stars or the gas by this process. Mm -hmm. So it's just because of the different nature, because the dark matter does not rotate, that you don't have this uh, coherent uh, resonance for all the dark matter. Maybe on individual particles, yes, but globally not like if you have a rotating disk. So that's the idea. If, of course, if you don't have a rotating disk in first principle, then you cannot remove, uh, that, that this idea would not help, would not work. <laughs> 